Chapter Twelve of Merton of the Movies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Merton of the Movies by Harry Leon Wilson. Chapter Twelve, Alias Harold Parmalee. Merton Gill awoke to the comforting realization that he was between sheets instead of blankets, and that this morning he need not obscurely leave his room by means of a window. As he dressed, however, certain misgivings to which he had been immune the day before gnawed into his optimism. He was sober now. The sheer intoxication of food after fasting, of friendly concern after so long a period when no one had spoken to him kindly or otherwise, had evaporated. He felt the depression following success. He had been rescued from death by starvation, but had anything more than this come about? Had he not fed upon the charity of a strange girl, taking her money without seeing ways to discharge the debt? How could he ever discharge it? Probably before this she had begun to think of him as a cheat. She had asked him to come to the lot, but had been vague as to the purpose. Probably his ordeal of struggle and sacrifice was not yet over. At any rate, he must find a job that would let him pay back the borrowed twenty-five dollars. He would meet her as she had requested, assure her of his honest intentions, and then seek for work. He would try all the emporiums in Hollywood. They were numerous, and some of them would need the services of an experienced assistant. This plan of endeavor crystallized as he made his way to the Holden lot. He had brought his package of stills, but only because the girl had insisted on seeing them. The Countess made nothing of letting him in. She had missed him, she said, for what seemed like months, and was glad to hear that he now had something definite in view, because the picture game was mighty uncertain, and it was only the lucky few nowadays that could see something definite. He did not confide to her that the definite something now within his view would demand his presence at some distance from her friendly self. He approached the entrance to stage five with head bent in calculation, and not until he heard her voice did he glance up to observe that the Montague girl was dancing from pleasure, it would seem, at merely beholding him. She seized both his hands in her strong grasp and revolved him at the center of a circle she danced. Then she held him off while her eyes took in the details of his restoration. "'Well, well, well!' That shows what a few ham and eggs and sleep will do. Kid, you gross a million at this minute. New suit, new shoes, snappy cravat right from the men's quality shop, and all shaved and combed slick and everything. Say, and I was afraid maybe you wouldn't show. He regarded her earnestly. Oh, I would have come back all right. I'd never forget that twenty-five dollars I owe you, and you'll get it back all right, only it may take a little time. I thought I'd see you for a minute and then go out and find a job, you know, a regular job in a store. Nothing of the sort, old trooper. She danced again about him, both his hands in hers, which annoyed him, because it was rather loud public behavior, though he forgave her in the light of youth and kindliness. No regular job for you, old Pippin. Nothing but acting all over the place, real acting that people come miles to see. Do you think I can really get a part? Perhaps the creature had something definite in view for him. Sure you can get a part. Yesterday morning I simply walked into a part for you. Come along over to the office with me. Goody, I see you brought the stills. I'll take a peek at them myself before Baird gets here. Baird, not the Buckeye comedy man. He was chilled by a sudden fear. Yes, Jeff Baird. You see, he is going to do some five reelers, and this first one has a part that might do for you. At least I told him some things about you, and he thinks you can get away with it. He went moodily at her side, thinking swift thoughts. It seemed ungracious to tell her of his loathing for the Buckeye comedies, those blasphemous caricatures of worthwhile screen art. It would not be fair. And perhaps here was a quick way to discharge his debt and be free of obligation to the girl. Of course, he would always feel a warm gratitude for her trusting kindness, but when he no longer owed her money, he could choose his own line of work. 
rather bondage to some Hollywood gashweiler than clowning in Baird's infamies. "'Well, I'll try anything he gives me,' he said at last, striving for the enthusiasm he could not feel. "'You'll go big, too,' said the girl. "'Believe me, kid, you'll go grand.' In Baird's offices she sat at the desk and excitedly undid the package of stills. "'We'll give him the once-over before he comes,' she said, and was presently exclaiming with delight at the art study of Clifford Armitage in evening dress, two straight fingers pressing the left temple, the face in three-quarter view. "'Well, now, if that ain't Harold Parmalee to the life! If it wasn't for that Clifford Armitage signed under it, you'd had me guessing. I knew yesterday you looked like him, but I didn't dream it would be as much like him as this picture is. Say, we won't show Baird this at first. We'll let him size you up and see if your face don't remind him of Parmalee right away. Then we'll show him this, and it'll be a cinch. And my, look at these others. Here you're a soldier, and here you're a, a, a polo player. That is polo, ain't it? Or is it tennis? And will you look at these stunning westerns? These are simply the best of all, on horseback and throwing a rope, and the fighting face with the gun drawn, and rolling a cigarette, and as I live, saying good-bye to the horse. Wouldn't that get you? Buck Benson to the life. Again and again she shuffled over the stills, dwelling on each with excited admiration. Her excitement was pronounced. It seemed to be a sort of nervous excitement. It had caused her face to flush deeply, and her manner, especially over the western pictures, at moments oddly approached hysteria. Merton was deeply gratified. He had expected the art studies to produce no such impression as this. The countess in the casting office had certainly manifested nothing like hysteria at beholding them. It must be that the Montague girl was a better judge of art studies. "'I always liked this one after the westerns,' he observed, indicating the Harold Parmalee pose. "'It's stunning,' agreed the girl, still with her nervous manner. "'I tell you, sit over there in Jeff's chair and take the same pose so I can compare you with the photo.' Merton obliged. He leaned an elbow on the chair arm and a temple on the two straightened fingers. "'Is the light right?' he asked, as he turned his face to the pictured angle. "'Fine!' applauded the girl. "'Hold it!' He held it, until shocked by shrill laughter from the observer. Peel followed Peel. She had seemed oddly threatened with hysteria. Perhaps now it had come. She rocked on her heels and held her hands to her sides. Merton arose in some alarm, and was reassured when the victim betrayed signs of mastering her infirmity. She wiped her eyes presently and explained her outbreak. "'You looked so much like Parmalee, I couldn't help thinking how funny it was. It just seemed to go over me like anything, like a spasm or something, when I got to thinking what Parmalee would say if he saw someone looking so much like him. See? That's why I laughed.' He was sympathetic and delighted in equal parts. The girl had really seemed to suffer from her paroxysm, yet it was a splendid tribute to his screen worth. It was at this moment that Baird entered. He tossed his hat on a chair and turned to the couple. "'Mr. Baird, shake hands with my friend Merton Gill. His stage name is Clifford Armitage.' "'Very pleased to meet you,' said Merton, grasping the extended hand." He hoped he had not been too dignified, too condescending. Baird would sometime doubtless know that he did not approve of those so-called comedies, but for the present he must demean himself to pay back some money borrowed from a working girl. "'Delighted,' said Baird. Then he bent a suddenly troubled gaze upon the gill lineaments. He held this a long moment, breaking it only with a sudden dramatic turning to Miss Montague. "'What's this, my child? You're playing tricks on the old man.' Again he incredulously scanned the face of Merton. "'Who is this man?' he demanded. "'I told you. He's Merton Gill from Gushwamp, Ohio,' said the girl, looking pleased and expectant. "'Simsbury, Illinois,' put in Merton quickly, wishing the girl could be better at remembering names. Baird at last seemed to be convinced. 
He heavily smote an open palm with a clenched fist. "'Well, I'll be swashed. I thought you must be kidding. If I'd seen him out on the lot, I'd a said he was the twin brother of Harold Parmalee.' "'There!' exclaimed the girl triumphantly. "'Didn't I say he'd see it right quick? You can't keep a thing from this old bay. Now, you just come over here to this desk and look at this fine batch of stills he had taken by a regular artist back in Cranberry.' Ah! exclaimed Baird unctuously. I bet they're good. Show me. He went to the desk. Be seated, Mr. Gill, while I have a look at these. Merton Gill, under the eye of Baird, which clung to him with something close to fascination, sat down. He took the chair with fine dignity, a certain masterly deliberation. He sat easily, and seemed to await a verdict confidently foreknown. Baird's eyes did not leave him for the stills until he had assumed a slightly Harold Parmalee pose. Then, his head bent with the girls over the pictures, he began to examine them. Exclamations of delight came from the pair. Merton Gill listened amiably. He was not greatly thrilled by an admiration which he had long believed to be his due. Had he not always supposed that things of precisely this sort would be said about those stills when at last they came under the eyes of the right people? Like the Montague girl, Baird was chiefly impressed with the westerns. He looked a long time at them, especially at the one where Merton's face was emotionally averted from his old pal Pinto at the moment of farewell. Regarding Baird, as he stood holding his art study up to the light, Merton became aware for the first time that Baird suffered from some nervous affliction, a peculiar twitching of the lips, a trembling of the chin, which he had sometimes observed in senile persons. All at once Baird seemed quite overcome by this infirmity. He put a handkerchief to his face and uttered a muffled excuse as he hastily left the room. Outside the noise of his heavy tread died swiftly away down the hall. The Montague girl remained at the desk. There was a strange light in her eyes, and her face was still flushed. She shot a glance of encouragement at Merton. "'Don't be nervous, old kid. He likes him all right,' he reassured her lightly. "'Oh, I'm not a bit nervous about him. It ain't as if he was doing something worth while instead of mere comedies.' The girl's color seemed to heighten. "'You be sure to tell him that. Talk right up to him.' Be sure to say mere comedies. It'll show him you know what's what. And as a matter of fact, kid, he's trying to do something worth while right this minute, something serious. That's why he's so interested in you. Well, of course, that's different. He was glad to learn this of Baird. He would take the man seriously if he tried to be serious, to do something fine and distinctive. Baird here returned, looking grave. The Montague girl seemed more strangely intense. She beckoned the manager to her side. Now, here, Jeff, here was something I just naturally had to laugh at. Baird had not wholly conquered those facial spasms, but he controlled himself to say, Show me. Now, Merton, directed the girl, take that same pose again, like you did for me, the way you are in this picture. As Merton adjusted himself to the Parmalee pose, she handed the picture to Baird. "'Now, Jeff, I ask you, ain't that Harold to the life? Ain't it so near him that you just have to laugh your head off?' It was even so. Baird and the girl both laughed convulsively, the former with rumbling chuckles that shook his frame. When he had again composed himself, he said, "'Well, Mr. Gill, I think you and I can do a little business.' I don't know what your idea about a contract is, but— Merton Gill quickly interrupted. Well, you see, I'd hardly like to sign a contract with you, not for those mere comedies you do. I'll do anything to earn a little money right now, so I can pay back this young lady, but I wouldn't like to go on playing in such things, with cross-eyed people and waiters on roller skates and all that. What I really would like to do is something fine and worth while— but not clowning in mere Buckeye comedies. Mr. Baird, who had devoted the best part of an active career to the production of Buckeye comedies, and who regarded them as at least one expression of the very highest art, did not even flinch at these cool words. He had once been an actor himself. 
Taking the blow like a man, he beamed upon his critic. "'Exactly, my boy. Don't you think I'll ever ask you to come down to clowning? You might work with me for years, and I'd never ask you to do a thing that wasn't serious. In fact, that's why I'm hoping to engage you now. I want to do a serious picture. I want to get out of all that slapstick stuff, see? Something fine and worth while, like you say. And you're the very actor I need in this new piece.' "'Well, of course, in that case—' This was different. He made it plain that in the case of a manager striving for higher things, he was not one to withhold a helping hand. He was beginning to feel a great sympathy for Baird in his efforts for the worth while. He thawed somewhat from the reserve that Buckeye comedies had put upon him. He chatted amiably. Under promptings from the girl, he spoke freely of his career, both in Simsbury and in Hollywood. It was twelve o'clock before they seemed willing to let him go, and from time to time they would pause to gloat over the stills. At last Baird said cheerily, "'Well, my lad, I need you in my new piece. How it'll be if I put you on my payroll beginning today at forty a week? How about it, hey?' "'Well, I'd like that first rate, only I haven't worked any today. You shouldn't pay me for just coming here.' The manager waved a hand airily. "'That's all right, my boy. You've earned a day's salary just coming in here to cheer me up. These mere comedies get me so down in the dumps sometimes. And besides, you're not through yet. I'm going to use you some more. Listen now.' The manager had become coldly businesslike. "'You go up to a little theater on Hollywood Boulevard, you can't miss it, where they're running a Harold Parmalee picture. I saw it last night, and I want you to see it today. Better see it afternoon and evening both.' "'Yes, sir,' said Merton. "'And watch Parmalee. Study him in this picture. You look like him already, but see if you can pick up some of his tricks. See what I mean? Because it's a regular Parmalee part I'm going to have you do, see? Kind of a society part to start with, and then we work in some of your Western stuff at the finish. But get Parmalee as much as you can. That's all now. Oh, yes, and can you leave these stills with me? Our publicity man may want to use them later.' "'All right, Mr. Baird. I'll do just what you say. And, of course, you can keep the stills as long as I got an engagement with you, and I'm very glad you're trying to do something really worth while.' "'Thanks,' said Baird, averting his face. The girl followed him into the hall. "'Great work, boy, and take it from me. You'll go over. Say honest now. I'm glad clear down to my boots.' She had both his hands again, and he could see that her eyes were moist. She seemed to be an impressionable little thing, hysterical one minute while looking at a bunch of good stills, and sort of weepy the next. But he was beginning to like her, in spite of her funny talk and free ways. "'And say,' she called after him when he had reached the top of the stairs, "'you know you haven't had much experience yet with a bunch of hard-boiled troopers. Many a one will be jealous of you the minute you begin to climb, and maybe they'll get fresh and try to kid you, see? But don't you mind it. Give it right back to them. Or tell me if they get too raw. Just remember, I got a mean right when I swing free. All right, thank you, he replied, but his bewilderment was plain. She stared a moment, danced up to him, and seized a hand in both of hers. "'What I mean, son, if you feel bothered any time by anything, just come to me with it, see? I'm in this piece, and I'll look out for you. Don't forget that.' She dropped his hand and was back in the office while he mumbled his thanks for what he knew she had meant as a kindness. So she was to be in the bared piece. She, too, would be trying to give the public something better and finer. Still, he was puzzled at her, believing he might need to be looked out for. An actor drawing forty dollars a week could surely look out for himself. He emerged into the open of the Holden lot as one who had at last achieved success after long and grueling privation. He walked briefly among the scenes of this privation, pausing in reminiscent mood before the Crystal Palace Hotel and other outstanding spots where he had so stoically suffered the torments of hunger and discouragement. He remembered to be glad now that no letter of appeal had actually gone to Gashweiler. Suppose he had built up in the old gentleman's mind a false hope that he might again employ Merton Gill. 
A good thing he had held out. Yesterday he was starving and penniless. Today he was fed and on someone's payroll for probably as much money a week as Gashweiler netted from his entire business. From sheer force of association, as he thus meditated, he found himself hungry, and a few moments later he was selecting from the food counter of the cafeteria whatever chanced to appeal to the eye. No weighing of prices now. Before he had finished his meal, Henshaw and his so-called governor brought their trays to the adjoining table. Merton studied with new interest the director who would some day be telling people that he had been the first to observe the aptitude of this new star, had, in fact, given him a lot of footage and close-ups and medium shots and dramatics in the blight of Broadway when he was a mere extra, before he had made himself known to the public in Jeff Baird's first worthwhile piece. He was strongly moved now to bring himself to Henshaw's notice when he heard the latter say, "'It's a regular Harold Parmalee part. Good light comedy, plenty of heart interest, and that corking fight off the cliff.' He wanted to tell Henshaw that he himself was already engaged to do a Harold Parmalee part, and had been told, not two hours ago, that he would by most people be taken for Parmalee's twin brother. He restrained this impulse, however, as Henshaw went on to talk of the piece in hand. It proved to be Robinson Crusoe, which he had already discussed, or rather not Robinson Crusoe any longer, not even Robinson Crusoe, Jr. It was to have been called Island Passion, he learned, but this title had been amended to Island Love. They're getting fed up on that word passion, Henshaw was saying, and anyhow love seems to go better with island, don't you think, Governor? Desert passion was all right. There's something strong and intense about a desert, but island is different. And it appeared that island love, though having begun as Robinson Crusoe, would contain few of the outstanding features of that tale. Instead of Crusoe's wrecked sailing ship, there was a wrecked steam yacht, a very expensive yacht stocked with all modern luxuries, nor would there be a native Friday in his supposed sister with a tattooed shoulder, but a wealthy young New Yorker and his valet, who would be good for comedy on a desert island, and a beautiful girl and a scoundrel who would in the last reel be thrown over the cliffs. Henshaw was vivacious about the effects he could get. I've been wondering, Governor, he continued, if we're going to kill off the heavy, whether we shouldn't plan it early that besides wanting this girl who's on the island, he's the same scoundrel that wronged the young sister of the lead that owns the yacht. See what I mean? It would give more conflict. But here, the Governor frowned and spoke after a moment's pause, your young New Yorker is rich, isn't he? Fine old family and all that. How could he have a sister that would get wronged? You couldn't do it. If he's got a wronged sister, he'd have to be a working man or a sailor or something. And she couldn't be a New York society girl. She'd have to be working some place, in a store or office, don't you see? How could you have a swell young New Yorker with a wronged sister? Real society girls never get wronged unless their father loses his money, and then it's never anything serious enough to kill a heavy for. No, that's out. Wait, I have it. Henshaw beamed with a new inspiration. You just said a sailor could have his sister wronged, so why not have one on the yacht? A good strong type, you know, and his little sister was wronged by the heavy, and he'd never know who it was, because the little girl wouldn't tell him, even on her deathbed. But he found the chap's photograph in her trunk, and on the yacht he sees that it was this same heavy. And there you are. Revenge, see what I mean? He fights with the heavy on the cliff, after showing him the little sister's picture, and pushes him over to death on the rocks below. Get it? And the lead doesn't have to kill him. How about that? Henshaw regarded his companion with pleasant anticipation. The governor again debated before he spoke. He still doubted. Say, whose show is this, the leads or the sailors that had the wronged sister? You'd have to show the sailor and his sister and show her being wronged by the heavy. That'd take a big cabaret set at least. And you'd have to let the sailor begin his stuff on the yacht, and then by the time he'd kept it up a bit after the wreck had pulled off the fight, where would your lead be? Can you see Parmalee playing second to this sailor? Why, the sailor'd run away with a piece, 
and the cabaret set would cost money when we don't need it. Just keep those things in mind a little. Well, Henshaw submitted gracefully, anyway, I think my suggestion of island love is better than island passion. Kind of sounds more attractive, don't you think? The governor lighted a cigarette. Say, Howard, it's a wonderful business, isn't it? We start with poor old Robinson Crusoe and his goats and a parrot and a man Friday, and after dropping Friday's sister, who would really be the Countess of Cleeg, we wind up with a steam yacht and a comic butler and call it Island Love. Who said the art of the motion picture is in its infancy? In this case it'll be plumb senile. Well, go ahead with the boys and dope out your hogwash. Gosh, sometimes I think I wouldn't stay in the business if it wasn't for the money. And remember, don't you let a single solitary sailor on that yacht have a wronged sister that can blame it on the heavy, or you'll never have Parmalee play in the lead. Again Merton Gill debated bringing himself to the notice of these gentlemen. If Parmalee wouldn't play the part for any reason like a sailor's wronged sister, he would. It would help him to be known in Parmalee parts. Still, he couldn't tell how soon they might need him, nor how soon Baird would release him. He regretfully saw the two men leave, however. He might have missed a chance even better than Baird would give him. He suddenly remembered that he still had a professional duty to perform. He must that afternoon, and also that evening, watch a Harold Parmalee picture. He left the cafeteria, swaggered by the watchman at the gate, he now had the professional standing to silence that fellow, and made his way to the theatre Baird had mentioned. In front he studied the billing of the Parmalee picture. It was Object Matrimony, a smashing comedy of love and laughter. Harold Parmalee, with a gesture of mock dismay, seemed to repulse a bevy of beautiful maidens who wooed him. Merton took his seat with a dismay that was not mock, for it now occurred to him that he had no experience in love scenes, and that an actor playing Parmalee parts would need a great deal of such experience. In Simsbury there had been no opportunity for an intending actor to learn certain little niceties expected at sentimental moments. Even his private life had been almost barren of adventures that might now profit him. He had sometimes played kissing games at parties, and there had been the more serious affair with Edwina May Pulver, nights when he had escorted her from church or sociables to the Pulver Gate and lingered in a sort of nervously worded ecstasy until he could summon courage to kiss the girl. Twice this had actually happened, but the affair had come to nothing because the Pulvers had moved away from Simsbury and he had practically forgotten Edwina May forgotten even the scared haste of those embraces. He seemed to remember that he had grabbed her and kissed her, but was it on her cheek or nose? Anyway, he was now quite certain that the mechanics of this dead amour were not those approved of in the best screen circles. Never had he gathered a beauteous girl in his arms, and very slowly, very accurately, very tenderly, done what Parmalee and the other screen actors did in their final fade-outs. Even when Beulah Baxter had been his screen ideal, he had never seen himself as doing more than save her from some dreadful fate. Of course, later, if he had found out that she was unwed. He resolved now to devote special study to Parmalee's methods of wooing the fair creature who would be found in his arms at the close of the present film. Probably Baird would want some of that stuff from him. From the very beginning of Object Matrimony, it was apparent that the picture drama would afford him excellent opportunities for studying the Parmalee technique in what an early subtitle called The Eternal Battle of the Sexes. For Parmalee in the play was Hubert Throckmorton, popular screen idol and surfeited with attentions of adoring women. Cunningly, the dramatist made use of Parmalee's own personality, of his screen triumphs, and of the adulation lavished upon him by discriminating fair ones. His breakfast tray was shown piled with missives, amply attesting the truth of what the interviewer had said of his charm. All women seemed to adore Hubert Throckmorton in the drama, 
even as all women adored Harold Parmalee in private life. The screen revealed Throckmorton quite savagely ripping open the letters, glancing at their contents and flinging them from him with humorous shudders. He seemed to be asking why these foolish creatures couldn't let an artist alone. Yet he was kindly in this half-humorous, half-savage mood. There was a blending of chagrin and amused tolerance on his face, as the screen had him murmur, casting the letter aside, "'Poor silly little girls!' From this early scene Merton learned Parmalee's method of withdrawing the gold cigarette case, of fastidiously selecting a cigarette, of closing the case, and of absently thinking of other matters, tamping the gold-tipped thing against the cover." This was an item that he had overlooked. He should have done that in the cabaret scene. He also mastered the Parmalee trick of withdrawing the handkerchief from the cuff of the perfectly fitted morning coat. That was something else he should have done in The Blight of Broadway. Little things like that, done right, gave the actor his distinction. The drama progressed. Millionaire Jasper Gordon, a power in Wall Street, was seen telephoning to Throckmorton. He was entreating the young actor to spend the weekend at his palatial Long Island country home to meet a few of his friends. The grim old Wall Street magnate was perturbed by Throckmorton's refusal, and renewed his appeal. He was one of those who always had his way in Wall Street, and he at length prevailed upon Throckmorton to accept his invitation. He then manifested the wildest delight, and he was excitedly kissed by his beautiful daughter, who had been standing by his side in the sumptuous library while he telephoned. It could be seen that the daughter, even more than her grim old father, wished Mr. Throckmorton to be at the Long Island country home. Later, Throckmorton was seen driving his high-powered roadster, accompanied only by his valet, to the Gordon country home on Long Island, a splendid mansion surrounded by its landscaped grounds, where fountains played and roses bloomed against the feathery background of graceful eucalyptus trees. Merton Gill here saw that he must learn to drive a high-powered roadster. Probably Baird would want some of that stuff, too. A round of country-house gaieties ensued, permitting Throckmorton to appear in a series of perfectly fitting sports costumes. He was seen on his favorite hunter, on the tennis courts, on the first tee of the golf course, on a polo pony, and in the mazes of the dance. Very early it was learned that the Gordon daughter had tired of mere social triumphs, and wished to take up screen acting in a serious way. She audaciously requested Throckmorton to give her a chance as leading lady in his next great picture. He softened his refusal by explaining to her that acting was a difficult profession, and that suffering and sacrifice were necessary to round out the artist. The beautiful girl replied that within ten days he would be compelled to admit her rare ability as an actress, and laughingly they wagered a kiss upon it. Merton felt that this was the sort of thing he must know more about. Throckmorton was courteously gallant in the scene. Even when he said, "'Shall we put up the stakes now, Miss Gordon?' it could be seen that he was jesting. He carried this light manner through minor scenes with the beautiful young girlfriends of Miss Gordon, who wooed him, lay in wait for him, ogled and sighed. Always he was the laughingly tolerant conqueror who had but a lazy scorn for his triumphs. He did not strike the graver note until it became suspected that there were crooks in the house bent upon stealing the famous Gordon jewels, that it was Throckmorton who averted this catastrophe by sheer nerve and by use of his rare histrionic powers, as when he disguised himself in the coat and hat of the arch-crook whom he had felled with a single blow, and left bound and gagged, in order to receive the casket of jewels from the thief who opened the safe in the library, and that he laughed away the thanks of the grateful millionaire, astonished no one in the audience, though it caused Merton Gill to wonder if he could fell a crook with one blow. He must practice up some blows. Throckmorton left the palatial country home, wearied by the continuous adulation. 
The last to speed him was the Gordon daughter, who reminded him of their wager. Within ten days he would acknowledge her to be an actress fit to play as his leading woman. Throckmorton drove rapidly to a simple farm where he was not known, and would be no longer surfeited with attentions. He dressed plainly in shirts that opened wide at the neck, and assisted in the farm labors, such as pitching hay and leading horses into the barn. It was the simple existence that he had been craving, away from it all. No one suspected him to be Hubert Throckmorton, least of all the simple country maiden, daughter of the farmer, in her neat print dress and heavy braid of golden hair that hung from beneath her sunbonnet. She knew him to be only a man among men, a simple farm laborer, and Hubert Throckmorton, wearied by the adulation of his feminine public, was instantly charmed by her coy acceptance of his attentions. That this charm should ripen to love was to be expected. Here was a child, simple, innocent, a wild rose beauty in her print dress and sunbonnet, who would love him for himself alone. Beside a blossoming orange tree on the simple Long Island farm, he declared his love, warning the child that he had nothing to offer her but two strong arms and a heart full of devotion. The little girl shyly betrayed that she returned his love, but told him that he must first obtain the permission of her grandmother, without which she would never consent to wed him. She hastened into the old farmhouse to prepare grandmother for the interview. Throckmorton presently faced the old lady, who sat huddled in an armchair, her hands crooked over a cane, a ruffled cap above her silvery hair. He manfully voiced his request for the child's hand in marriage. The old lady seemed to mumble an assent. The happy lover looked about for his fiancée when, to his stupefaction, the old lady arose briskly from her chair, threw off cap, silvery wig, gown of black, and stood revealed as the child herself, smiling roguishly up at him from beneath the sunbonnet. With a glad cry he would have seized her, when she stayed him with lifted hand. Once more she astounded him. Swiftly she threw off sunbonnet, blonde wig, print dress, and stood before him revealed as none other than the Gordon daughter. Hubert Throckmorton had lost his wager. Slowly, as the light of recognition dawned in his widening eyes, he gathered the beautiful girl into his arms. "'Now may I be your leading lady?' she asked. "'My leading lady, not only in my next picture, but for life,' he replied. There was a pretty little scene in which the wager was paid. Merton studied it. Twice again that evening he studied it. He was doubtful. It would seem queer to take a girl around the waist that way and kiss her so slowly. Maybe he could learn. And he knew he could already do that widening of the eyes. He could probably do it as well as Parmalee did. Back in the Buckeye office, when the Montague girl had returned from her parting with Merton, Baird had said, "'Kid, you've brightened my whole day.' "'Didn't I tell you?' "'He's a lot better than you said.' But can you use him? You can't tell. You can't tell till you try him out. He might be good, and he might blow up right at the start. I bet he'll be good. I tell you, Jeff, that boy is just full of acting. All you gotta do, keep his stuff straight, serious. He can't help but be funny that way. We'll see. Tomorrow we'll kind of feel him out. He'll see this Parmalee film today. I caught it last night, and there's some stuff in it I want to play horse with, see? So I'll start him tomorrow in a quiet scene and find out does he handle. If he does, we'll go right into some hokum drama stuff. The more serious he plays it, the better. It ought to be good, but you can't ever tell in our trade. You know that as well as I do. The girl was confident. I can tell about this lad, she insisted. End of chapter 12